All right, back again. This session is going to cover shooting with a bellows diffuser, which is a nice soft diffuse light. I'm going to shoot a smaller specimen that with a 100 millimeter lens in a Z stacking form. So I'm going to be taking many slices of the specimen and stitching them together. This will cover the uh, passport um, program. This will cover Capture One and will cover um, our stacking program and also Photoshop. So this is a long one. I'm going to start with a true bug. Um, now, I didn't know what lens to grab on this, so what do, I, what do I do? But what did I do? I measure it out, and it measures out to about 18 millimeters from tip to tail. Again, I'm going to keep that out of the way until my lens is mounted. I went on to my lens sheet, and here's a, a lens that measures material from, from uh, 15 millimeters to 200 millimeters. Well, that, that's perfect. This is going to be on the smaller side for the 100 millimeter. It says here at f5.6 to f8 is perfect. And that's it. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick my 100 millimeter lens and put it on. Now, again, when I come in this morning to, to start this up, I turned all my, my uh, power switches on. And of course, my camera came on. But because I'm going to put a lens on it, one of the first things I did was I turned the camera off. So it was on this morning. I just turned it off because when we mount the lens, we don't want the camera on. So now I'm going to go into my lens box and I'm going to take out my Canon 100 millimeter lens. There we go. Mindful to keep the front lens cap on at all times. I'm going to remove the body cap on the camera itself. Noting there is nothing underneath the camera. I mentioned when we were shooting the 35 millimeter that if you drop a lens, you can destroy a specimen. I know a few people that have dropped just a lens cap, a body cap, hitting a specimen and destroying a type specimen. So again, keep your stuff away from that camera until everything is mounted. Red dot facing forward, red dot on the camera. I put the lens up, I mount the dots, and then I turn it. Now you'll hear a click the lens is locked into place. So now I'm going to remove my lower lens cap and I'm going to keep all of my lens caps back and out of the way so they're off the scene. All right, so now I can safely turn my camera back on. Now I'll be able to look at live view through Capture One. So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to turn live view on, so while I'm staging my specimen, I can look at my monitor and get a general idea of where things are going. So what I'll do, in the ambient room light, I'll bring my specimen over and I'll put it on my easel. I'm using my clear base just as a place to put it. I like, <clears throat> I like using this clear base simply because it allows me a really easy and effective way to move the entire thing. I could put my gray pad directly on the easel and the image would be the same. You just only see, you're only going to see around the true bug, but it just becomes a little more difficult to move, especially if I've got a bellows around it. So by keeping it on the acrylic base, it just makes, makes life so much easier. So now I'm going to put the bellows on it. Actually, no, I'm going to turn on my live view first, see where I am. So I go over the computer and I just click on live view. And now I've got just this the ambient light in the room is usually enough to see the gain on this camera. I'm going to loosen my copy stand rail and I'm going to start moving my camera down. I've set my magnification. I'm going to set my magnification at one to one, which is the highest magnification I can get uh, on this uh, lens. That's, that's important because we're shooting at something that's at the smallest range of this lens. So that's a, that's a no-brainer. Also, I want to mention that my electronic rail, I, I, I usually, at the end of the day, I usually put the rail back to where it's just about in the middle. So the camera is set in the middle of the rail, so I've got plenty of room to move on top or plenty of room to move down below. You don't want to get to a point where you've got your camera all the way on either end of the rail and you just can't move it. You just want it somewhere where you've got a little bit of room to work with. So 
I'm bringing my camera down and I'm looking at my live view and I'm bringing it into the center. Now you can probably see over on the live view as I'm bringing this down slowly, you can start to see the specimen come into focus and there it is. So I will lock this down. I will rotate my specimen to where I think it's oriented correctly. So that's basically my field of view and my specimen location. Now I want to add the diffuser. <coughs> because this diffuser collapses down low, it's really convenient to be able to slide it in uh, even while your lens is in close proximity. So I can bring it in here, park it down there, and now I'm ready to start putting my lights into the solution. First thing I will do, I will secure my, my speed light again, right at the head, loosen the knob, bring it up, turn it on, and point it in a general copy stand. And this is like anywhere between 30 and 45 degree angle, directly at the specimen. And I'm, I'm about, oh, I'm going to be about a foot away from it. Maybe something like this. Now, also too, you don't want to, when you're, when you're extending these flash arms, there's a point that these things will not support the weight of the head if they're, if they're drawn all the way out in a very awkward position and you go to tighten them. You can tighten them down all the way and they'll start to creep down like this. So what you want to do is you want to sort of stack them so that they're angled and they're, and they're supported so when you tighten these things down, it takes very little to hold them into place. Locks them in. I'm going to put the AC on this one. I'm actually going to set this one up. So it's something like that. And the further I have to reach into this table with my flashhead, the less stable it's going to be. It's most stable sitting straight up at the edge. So you could actually slide your copy stand up. But for our purposes, this will be just fine. So now, if you can see on the screen, you can see the spectral highlights that are typical of the modeling lamp or the flash. And then if I add the diffuser to it, I'm just going to pull the diffuser up over the lens. You'll see how all those spectral highlights went away and everything got really soft. A good place to look is on the tail end of this bug on the wing. You can see it, it almost looks like it's covered in glitter. And once we put the diffuser up there, all that goes away and it's just buttery soft. So I'm going to put my diffuser back up here. I'm going to string it up like this. I, I just pull the cinch up and I let the cord fall down somewhere behind the camera. And that's it. As long as the lens is, is going through that hole, it doesn't have to be in the hole. It can be an inch or two above it. As long as you're shooting down into the diffuser, that's it. Now, even with everything mounted, I can still move my specimen around comfortably and set it wherever I want. It's very easy. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over into Capture One and I'm going to shoot this first with TTL. Then we're going to look at what our output, I'm going to look at the output that my flash heads are giving me. And then I'm going to go use that as a baseline and go into manual mode. And I'll walk you through all of Capture One and how to catch a, a Z stacking image. That's next. Okay, now that we've got our, our true bug set up under the camera, I'll put my live view back on. And I'm going to turn on my modeling lamp. So I'm not using my uh, second remote. I'm just using the remote that's on the camera right now. Yeah, it's just a little easier. Sometimes the flashes do get confused when you use two remotes. Um, sometimes also, too, the flashes will go to sleep and you just have to wake them up by hitting any button on the remote to wake up the flash or firing it. But right now everything's working well. I wanted to get an idea of where we're focused precisely and that's where I wanted to be, right on those wings. I'm going to close this out. I am going to turn off my modeling lamps and I'm going to take one shot. Again, I have my live view off. Now you heard the double click on that. That means it's in TTL mode. It sends one flash out to meter and one flash out to deliver the exposure. When you're shooting in manual, it's just a single pop. That's why I really like to shoot in manual mode. 
Um, I'll do a TTO like this to see where my baseline is. So if I don't know whether I'm going to shoot at an exposure of three or four or five or six, this gives me a good idea. It gives me a general overall image. Nice. It's got me in the, in the exposure zone that I want. And I'm going to look on the back of my, uh, my flash heads right now. And they're at 5.2. So I'm going to go back over to my remote and I'm going to switch it from TTL to manual mode. And I'm going to put it to 5.2, which is just where the TTL was giving it. And I'll take another shot. Now you hear just a single shot. And there's our image, single shot. You don't hear the double click. And there we go. So if I want to take this down or up, I might even actually reduce this a hair. So I'm going to bring it down to, I'm going to hit the minus sign and bring it down to 5.0. So I've reduced it by two tenths of an F stop. Now let's take another. Now watch our histogram. I'm going to take a shot. The histogram will move to the left. There we go. So there's a difference between two tenths of a stop. And I kind of like it. That's a little bright for me. That's nice. So I'm going to stick with that. So this is how you find your exposure. So again, let me white balance this guy, this last one. So I'm going to grab my white balance picker. I'm going to pick my out of focus gray background. Click it once. Now I'm white balanced. I'm going to hit my regular delete key on the keyboard for this one. Delete it. And now all the rest of these I can hit Delete all, which is MX10 on my keyboard, and that'll get rid of them. Okay, so now I'd be ready to do a stack. But because I want to show you what all these functions are, and some of them require that I have an image up here, I'm going to take our shot, which will be manual focus, or manual exposure, right where we want it. That's perfect. There's our exposure. Good. Let me start with this. The, to, to make a new session... Um, right now we're on guest. If I want to make a new session and I want to call it Roy. So I'll go file and I'm going to say new session and I'm simply going to put my name on there. I recommend that every Avid user have their own session so that their, their, their export preferences, their imaging preferences are theirs and not someone else's. It puts everything on the primary image drive in a folder called Capture One. If I open up the primary image drive, I have a folder called Capture One, and all the different catalogs or all the different sessions are in there. There's one for guest, and there's one for user one. There'll be another one for Roy in a minute. So I've got my name there. Everything else stays as default. I hit OK. It's going to close this session out, and it's going to start a brand new one with my name on the top. So there I go, my new session. So I'm going to take a shot again. Now the way the folders work, that's our first tab over here. All you really have to, all, you don't have to worry about any of this stuff here. All you really have to concern yourself about are, is the capture folder, the output location, and the garbage can. So basically the, this, and I'll open up my folder in here. This is what makes up Capture One. So I've got my session. I've got the Capture folder where the RAWs go. I've got the Output folder where I can make subfolders where all of my TIFFs that are coming out of this, all my exported images are going to go into the Output folder. The Selects folder we're not going to use right now. And the Trash folder, that's where all the things that I hit the Delete key are, are going to go. So if you hit the standard keyboard Delete key like we do when we're white balancing, they'll go into the Trash bucket. And you have to empty that every once in a while. You can actually go into your folders here and empty it here. If you right click on it, you can uh, em empty, empty the images here. I think, yeah, empty trash right there at the bottom. But anyway, so we're into the captures folder. This is the raw image right here. The next tab over, this is exciting. This is the camera control. And so here you have uh, the... Um, speed of the camera, you have the ISO, you have the aperture of the camera, it's set for spot metering, 
This is the live view. You click on the live view and you'll get the live view image, which is right now there's no modeling lights on it. I'm going to turn off live view for a minute. This is the capture uh, that will actually fire the camera via the USB. You've got a few camera settings here. If you push this down, all of these are controllable from inside Capture One. These are all the settings that you would normally have to crawl into the back of your camera and get into. So uh, there's no reason to stand up and go and, and crane your neck over the back of your camera anymore. Everything is there. Now, I've gone ahead and I've preset your camera, and I've listed the proper settings for your camera in your manual in case they ever get changed. If, if somebody takes the camera home for the weekend and, and photographs the kids and stuff, it's, it's okay. You can bring it back, and you can set it back to factory default. So um, that's it for the, for the setting for the camera window. Basically, all you're going to be concerned about is the fire button and the live view. The ICC profile on this, I'm going to set at... Canon, actually, if I set it for default, it's going to be, um, that's fine. That's that's coming out of the camera. That's what I want. That's the camera's uh, uh, ICC color profile embedded in the camera. Everything else is factory. Don't worry about it. You're done. Uh, every capture session uh, right now, when I bring in an image, and you can see it over here, it has the name of the session with a camera counter. If you want to change that, you can. Um, you can pick any number of things. You can um, take the name off. I just highlight it and hit delete. I can take the camera counter off and hit delete. I can just change it to, let's say, a three-digit counter and just drag it up. And there you go, three-digit counter. I hit OK. And now the next one I shoot will just have a three-digit counter onto it. You see it up here? So. It, it, it's entirely up to you how you want to name it. It's irrelevant, though, because these are temporary. These are the RAWs. You're going to be exporting out to a big TIFF file, and you're doing a stack. So it's really only while you're during, looking at a capture session that these uh, names are relevant. And so, so you can call it whatever you want. The next tab is in the Lens section. Now, Capture One is really smart. Canon also works with Phase One. So there are lens profiles. Now, this particular lens, the 100 millimeter lens, has a profile that Capture One uses to reduce or eliminate chromatic aberration. Uh, it'll hide any distorted areas. And if, I've, if I'm shooting with my lens past its diffraction limited point, in other words, if I'm shooting at like f16, I can put in diffraction correction. And this thing amazing what it does and normally when you stop a lens down too far the image looks muddy and uh, out of focus it's very soft this really really makes a nice correction so when you're abusing your lenses this is a nice thing to have um, there are a whole lot of other, there's a whole crop uh, crop selection tool that you can define uh, crop sizes and shapes ratios um, there's so much you can do here it, there are 10,010 things you can do with Capture One, and you only need to know how to do 10 of them. So to keep things very simple, leave everything here alone. You don't need to do any lens correction. You don't need to do any color correction either. It's all kind of factory set for you. You've got your ICC profile as the Canon uh, EOS 5, 5, um, 5DSR generic, which is what you want. The next tab that you're going to be concerned about is going to be the output tab. Uh, now, this is this is where it determines uh, your files, your exporting, and all that stuff. We're going to be shooting uh, TIFF 8-bit right down here. So we're going to be shooting that. That's what I want to set as my output. So it says TIFF 8-bit 8 8 uncompressed. These are what I'm going to make out of my raw image. Now, output location is pretty cool. The output folder, but you can make a subfolder. So all of my images go into my output folder. But if I want to make a subfolder, so if I'm shooting this bug, I can, I can use a collection number. I can use the name of the insect. I could say plant bug. I could, I could uh, if I'm shooting a branch, I can make the subfolder for branch. So I, can, I can use the date, today's date on it. I can make a, any number of subfolders. 
Then down here, I need to actually name the file. Again, this is a lot like naming the file coming in the camera. You can do whatever you want. I typically give it a job name, which is a unique name, a couple of underscores, and a three-digit counter to keep the stacking program straight. But these are some of the other coins you can, you can use that are factory. Or you can click this button and make your own. So there's, it's virtually unlimited with what you can, how you can name your files. Now if you want to put uh, another underscore in there, you just, you just grab the underscore, um, and then you could put um, anything you wanted to. So, so this is how I have it set up. So we'll use that. Now here I can put in, I can put in a, the name of the, the name of the thing. I can say true bug. And um, I'm going to say that I want to put my lens in it and my, my magnification. So I'm going to do true bug underscore 100 millimeter underscore one dash one. So now I know I'm shooting the true bug with a hundred millimeter macro lens at one to one. That's it. And so see what it, here's the example it gives you true bug, hundred millimeter, one to one dash zero 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 so this this way that the the last three on the end of this are numbers that the stacking program will use to keep the files in the right sequence and that's it that's all there is to it so what we're going to do is we're going to shoot a bunch of raw files we're going to select them and then we're going to hit the process tab and what that's going to do is it's going to turn them into this which is an 8-bit tiff and if you look at it it's going to be 143 megs if we chose the 16-bit TIFF, it brings it up to 287 megs. It's absolutely double the size. You won't see much difference in the actual file. But the difference between 16-bit and 8-bit TIFF is described in your manuals when trying to decide what color depth you want. And that's going to depend on what you're using your images for. If you're going to use them for online, typically 8-bit TIFFs in, in sRGB are fine. If you're using these to output to press and you're using a wide gamut like Adobe 1998 or Profoto, then you're going to want to look at a 16-bit. All of this is detailed in agonizingly granular detail in your manuals under 8-bit uh, versus 16-bit. There's also a section there for uh, wide gamut versus sRGB, a whole, a whole top paper on that. So moving right along here, We've got in this tab over here, exposure, which is really cool. You've got a lot of stuff you can play with here. Be careful because you can do a lot of damage here. Um, one of the things as we go down here, you see how it says clarity and structure? Okay, clarity is essentially contrast and structure is essentially sharpness. I've got this set to a factor of 15 for both which is so mild you can't even see it. But what I do is that it, it, it makes up for the fact that it's just a little tiny. It just gives it a little tiny bit of a punch because I like it a little on the sharper side, but I don't want to completely annihilate it in Photoshop. So if I, if I give it this, this little micro bit of, of sharpening contrast, each image I shoot when I do a stack, it just means that I don't have to hit it as hard in Photoshop if I want to sharpen it. I, I find this to be a perfect setting for this. Um, other than that, you really don't need to mess with anything else on this. Um, I'm going to get up into this other tab here. Oh, gosh. Okay, this is sharpening, noise reduction. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, most of this stuff, we're gonna, you, can, you can play with noise reduction if you're shooting some really dark stuff. Um, Sharpening, no. We're going to do this in Photoshop because we've got some rather incredible sharpening algorithms that we use. Don't need that one. You don't need this one. Uh, you know. Okay, this is, the, this is the metadata tab. And if you like to store metadata, you can put all kinds of stuff in here. You can put watermarks, trademarks, 
web addresses. You can do all kinds of stuff that'll stick to the metadata of your image. And if you make the metadata, you can make a metadata preset. Again, there's a paper on uh, dealing with metadata in Capture One in your user's manual. It's a deep subject. Not a lot of people do it. Some museums mandate that they manage the metadata, but this is how you do it. That's the metadata tab up in there. And then they're getting over here to uh, batch uh, file creating. And we're not going to get into that either. So we've covered the very, very basics here. Um, so we're going to go back and start shooting a stack. It should be quite simple for us. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to, let's see, let's get rid of these, all of these. So I'm just going to hit delete all and start from scratch. So I'm going to turn on my modeling lights. I'll put, on, I'll put on my live view, go to my camera, live view. And I'll put on the modeling light so I can see what I'm looking at. Essentially, what I want to do is I want to find the, uh, first I want to establish exposure. So turn this off and I take a shot. Okay, we've established that this is the exposure we wanted to have in the first place. So now I'm going to grab my, my white balance tool right here, and I'm going to pick anywhere on the gray background that isn't overly saturated. I just clicked it, so now it's white balance. It's absolutely accurate on the money. If I hit the delete key on the keyboard, it will get rid of this image, but it will retain that white balance information. If I hit one of my permanent delete keys like MX9 or MX10, it will delete this image from the disk and it will also delete the data that it's retaining. So we'll take a few more shots and we'll look at it and I'll show you how to delete a whole, a whole stack of them without wiping out your white balance information. So I want to go down, I want to find the bottom of this uh, image first. So um, I'm going to start up my, my um, Passport software. I hit my keyboard for Passport, and I'm going to hit Take Picture. I'm going to reduce the splash screen behind this, and now I can move my motor up and down. I'll put on my Live View. Okay. So as I move down, you'll see the antenna come in and the legs come in. Okay, so this is my lowest point on the antenna. Actually, I'm, I'm going to double click at 100%. I'm actually seeing this leg is the lowest point. And as I go down, it's disappearing. So if I bring it back up, let me go on the antenna. Let me go up a little bit first. Okay, as I'm going down, I'm hitting the down button. And you can start to see the antenna come into focus. That's the tip of the antenna. And I'm almost at the tip of that leg, so I'm going to go down a little bit more. Okay, can you see it? And that's the end of that leg joint. So that's my lowest point. So what I would do is I would say at that point over here, I'm going to say stop here. Now I've got to make sure I've got the right lens going on here. So I'm going to pick my Canon 100 millimeter macro. And I'm not using the, the 1.4 teleconverter. It has a spot for that too. I'm going to take this lens and select it. I'm going to select F8, and my magnification is 1 to 1. This is important because this determines the depth of focus that we've got to work with. And if we're going to tell it where to start and where to stop, it won't know what stack sizes to make unless we give it this information, which tells it what the depth of field is. So we've established our lenses. We've established our stopping point. Now we have to establish our starting point. So we're going to, we've got the, we've got it. See how it says in parentheses, it's set. So now you know your, 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 your stop point is set. Let's go up to the top simply by pressing this button and holding it. Watch our live view. You start to see it come into focus. Now what I like to do, and I'll double click on it so you can see it. I like to bring it past my highest point. Here's my high point. Now I'm past the high point. What I like to do is go past the high point and then come back down so my motor and my lead screw are already positioned in the down position and I work my way down to where my, see how this is just starting to come into focus? That's it. That's my start point. 
and I hit start here. So I've gone up and then brought it back down to my uppermost point and then stop it. And I say, start here. So now it's telling me it's going to take nine calculated steps to get from the top to the bottom based on the 100 millimeter lens at f8 at one to one. That's that works. So now I'm going to take I'm going to close this out and just for fun. So we have an extra image. I'm going to take a pop at the top. OK, so here's our top area. Now, if I grab my hand and I double click on it, you can see that we're focused tightly on the top. So now, like when you, when you have multiple images, right? So let's say we wanted to white balance on our last image. So we grab our white picker, we click it. It's now white balanced. I will use the regular delete key on my keyboard to get rid of this guy. Delete. And I can use the other delete key, M MX9, to get rid of this one. And that way it's permanently gone. Otherwise, I'm not filling up my garbage can with a bunch of stuff that I have to remember to empty all the time. So now we're ready to we're ready to start. Now there's a couple things here we want to look at. One of them is step overlap. This is increase or decrease the overlap of the step. Now, if you were shooting something that's that's like on a 45 degree angle and it has a granular structure on it, and you started to see slight banding, you may want to increase the overlap. So if I increase, you see it, it's taking more slices. So as I increase the overlap, it's going to take more slices. It's letting each slice overlap more. Now, if you're shooting something three-dimensional like a spider, you might find that you can go negative overlap and, and require far fewer slices and be just fine because you don't have that granular slope where you would see a band. But the, the great place to start is right at zero. There's no reason to mess with that. Now, speed-wise, I've given you three seconds between shots. That is because... At 100% power, these lights take three seconds to recycle. So this is a this is a foolproof setting. But because we're shooting at a very low power, we're shooting at about half power. You can set this for something like a thousand, which is one second, and this thing will shoot very quickly, and you'll be just fine. If you're shooting something in ethanol, you may want to set this for a five second delay so that you have time for the fluid to settle down from vibrations on the table. So I'm going to turn off my modeling lamps right now. I'll just show you, I have my live, I'll put on my live view so you can see it. Okay, so I've got my live view on. I'm going to turn off my modeling lamps. Now I've got this dimly lit room and I'm going to turn off live view. Very, very, very important. If you don't turn off live view, this will misfire because it cannot shoot a sequence one after the other with live view on. It won't do it. So you have to close out live view. And now we're simply going to hit start and let it run. This is in real time. Now it says it's calculated nine steps. That's going to equal 10 images because it takes an image and then makes its first step. So when we see up here 10 images, we know we're done. You'll hear it go back. OK, so now it's gone back. It's got 10 images, and it's gone back to the top. Let's go down to our bottom image and look. Actually, we've got more than we need. Oh, there's our knee right there. There's our bottom image. Um, yeah. We've actually gone maybe a little too far. Yep, there's our next one up, and the antenna's in, in focus, and our knee's in focus. Yeah, I don't see any advantage to having this bottom one. So I'm going to delete it, which is great. We're preening, we're sort of um, pruning the images out, so we don't need that bottom one. Now we're going to go through, and as we're going up and up, we start to see these legs coming into focus, and we just want to make sure we have our top in focus, which we do. It's absolutely razor sharp, so that we're done. So now we're going to select all these. I'm going to hit MX7, which will select all of our thumbnails. Then I'm going to hit the uh, MX8, which is the export key, which brings up this window. 
I'm going to put it into a subfolder and I'll call it TrueBug. And so my job name is TrueBug 100 millimeter dash one to one. That's what we already had, had already named that before. So that's it. So then I'm going to hit, now we're going to be making 100, 143 meg, 10 images. So it's going to take some time to process 10 images at 143 megs each. So we hit process. And here's the uh, process indicator. And there you go. And there you go. And there you go. And done. So there's all 10 images. And we're going to reduce this down. And now we can do something like Helicon. Let's bring up Helicon Focus. That's uh, MX4. So I punch that in. Now Helicon's kind of cool in that you can you can drag and drop the images into Helicon. So what I'm gonna, well, both of them you can. So I'm going to go into Capture One Shortcut. I'm going to go into my folder, Output, True Bug. Okay, so that's where I ha had all my images. I'm going to um, select all, and I'm going to drag it over here. And I'm going to close that out. And I think, yeah, I've got nine images in here. So there we go. Now, to fire this up, I've got uh, method C, which is the most accurate. And this one takes the longest, to, longest time to, to produce, but it's also the most accurate. So all you have to do once you drag your stuff in here is hit this little button that says Render. And it's done. You hold a normal mouse button down and you can look around and see where you've got everything in focus down to the tips of the wings. And there's the little knee joint. Um, this took just a few seconds to do. And that's it. So now we're going to go file and we can go save. What I like to do is I like to grab any one of my original images because they have the file name that I want on there. And on the end of it, instead of where it has the number, I'm going to put down comp, C-O-M-P, and I'll put an underscore for Helicon, knowing that it's not, it's not my other program, Serene, it's Helicon, and it's saving as a TIFF. And I, and I simply hit save, and I can close out of this program, and now I can start Photoshop. Okay, Photoshop's open. Now we're going to open up our file. We're going to file, open. I'm going to go down to our comp, true bug, comp. I'm going to whoop, click on that and hit open. <clears throat> Beautiful. Okay, before I do anything, I'm going to save it as a copy. So I'm going to go file, save as, and I will just note it. Uh, with edits. So now I know that if I do sharpening or uh, put a scale bar on this or do whatever, it is not the original file that came out of my composite program. So I'm going to look at some things that I can do to this. Um, first, before I get too much further into this, all of my editing should be done at, a, if possible, 100% magnification. That way there's no interpolation of the image. To get 100% in Photoshop, you simply hit Control-Alt-0, and that brings you to 100%. At this point, now I can grab my hand and drag things around. I'm going to look at a couple of things. If there are any uh, shadows that I want to bring out, I can go into Shadow Highlights, which is fun. So I can go to Image, Adjustments, Shadow Highlights, turn that way down. Let's do a quick preview. So that's without the shadow highlights. This will bring the shadows up just a hair. This sort of brightens it. Um, it's only at 2%. Sometimes this is nice. Um, I'm actually not going to do this right now. I'll hit cancel. I just wanted to take a peek at it. I'm going to go to image, adjust. I'll go into levels. I'll start looking at my, bring up my white points a little bit. And there's a preview. That's without it. That's with it. I can bring those up just a hair. 
and that's fine. I actually like some of the shadows in there. Shadow highlights is typically a great tool when you want to get down into these crevices and pull detail out that you can't see, but we can see all this just fine. Now, the next thing people, <clears throat> people do all the time is they want to sharpen. Well, there are, I'm going to keep this short and simple. The basic ways to sharpen this would be to go to filter, sharpen, and pick one of these algorithms from Photoshop. There's unsharp mask or smart sharpen. Both of them work just fine. I've also given you some F keys. Um, put this back up again. I've also given you some F keys, F2, F3, and F4. Mild sharpening, medium sharpening, and extremely aggressive sharpening. But my favorite sharpening of all is the uh, F8 and F9 on this keyboard. F8 will actually separate the color off the image. It'll, it'll show you a black and white image with a separate layer of color. I'm going to punch F8 now. All right, there you go. Now, if you go over here on layers, and, oh, sorry, I just knocked it out. Window layers. If we go over here on layers, you can see that my background copy is active. There's a little eyeball on it. There's my color. Now, if I turn off my background copy, this just shows just the color that's in the image. So actually, if we're on this layer, this active layer here, and we're not on this color layer, we're not doing anything to the color. So we're going to sharpen this. Now, the sharpen key for this is simply F, F9. I can't hit F9 on this because the recording program I'm using, F9 is the key you use to stop it. <laughs> so I'm going to have to go over here to, action, to uh, Actions, and I'm going to go up, up here to my uh, F9, which is right here. And it says sharpen. I'll highlight that and just tell it to play. Now, before I click play, let's look at something. Let's look at the head in here. So um, on F9, I'm going to sharpen. I'm going to hit play and watch this head. Boom. It got really sharp, but it didn't get pixelated. So I'm going to go back to my layers and I'm going to turn my color on and look what we have. We have crisp like a razor from one end to the other. This is so simple, but yet so effective. It's my favorite sharpening algorithm. All right, I'm going to reduce the mag on this a little bit. I'm going to crop my image because I don't want so much background in there. I'm going to do a typical specimen crop. There we go. Come on, go ahead. Crop it. Okay. Are we done? Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to put a, a measurement scale in here now. So I am going to hit my F7 key, which brings up my possible measurement scales. So as you can see here, there's the camera with the lenses, with every one of the different mags, with and without the, the teleconverter. So I'm going to go down here to the 5DS, 100 millimeter, one to one. Not to be confused with uh, the, uh, actually, that's one-to-one. -one. This is one-to-one -one with the 1.4x. Big difference. So there's one-to-one. -one. I'll click on that. And now it's calibrated. Now if I hit M7, or another way to do this is to go to Image. I'll show you another way to do this. Image, Analysis, uh, Place Scale Marker. So all that is taken up with M7. So this tells me how many uh, millimeters I want to I want to put on here. So I'm going to put um, I'll do five millimeters. This is um, aerial aerial uh, font, and I want to bring this up to something I can read, like 14 point. I don't know why Adobe defaults to four point font. Anyway. So I want the color black, and I want the text position underneath my line. I simply hit OK, and it drops it in there. And now we can click on that and drag it and move it to wherever we want to have it. That's it. Now we're going to bring it back, Control-Alt-0, and we have everything in place. Now, right now, my measurement scale is on a separate layer. So if you want to flatten all this out, you can. Another fun feature in this is that I've uh, 
I've set it up to where you can you can put the file name, whatever the file name is, in either black or white font along the lower left hand corner of your uh, image and it will automatically flatten the image as well. What this is commonly used for is when you're preparing an image to send off to another institution, you want to put a unique identifier in there or a copyright in there as part of your file name and you want to embed it into the image and flatten it and that's that. So there's no ambiguity about where it came from. So I'm going to go uh, F5, which is file name black, and it puts it right here in the bottom automatically for me. And look, my image is now flat. So that's that. So now I'm going to go save this out again because I saved it as the um, uh, uh, file with edits. So now all I have to do is just go file, save, and I'm done. Close it out. All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to shoot uh, with the uh, same lens, but by using with using the 1.4 teleconverter. So we'll do that one next.